we could. So, hello everybody and welcome, welcome to this uh, mass observation uh, public talk series. Um, it's really lovely to see so many of you here today. Um, and I uh, want to introduce myself. I'm Fiona Courage and I'm the director of the Mass Observation Archive based at the University of Sussex. And my colleague, Jen Purcell, who is a professor of history at St. Michael's College, is actually uh, beaming in from Vermont. So we have a bit of a, a time difference going on there. And we're very well, well, I'm very grateful for the fact that she's always prepared to get up early for us to have our meetings together. <laughs> But the other reason that I, I'm telling you this is because we've had to do all of the preparation, not just for the book we're writing, but also for this presentation um, at various times. So we're hoping it's going to be really slick. But who knows? It's the age of Zoom. So um, I'm sure you'll enjoy all of the things that do go a little bit wrong, all the banana skins. Um, so what we're talking about today is um, a book that we're both writing together and it's very much a work in progress. And I feel a little embarrassed to say that because we seem to have been working on it for quite a long time. But my excuse is, and I believe the publisher might be in the room, my excuse is that so many interesting things have been happening to British royal family over the last um, few years that we are um, just gathering more and more information all of the time, which is uh, really exciting. But it also means that we haven't completed. So what you are going to hear about is very much a work in progress. Um, and I think you're also going to hear um, essentially what is myself and Jen is a working meeting. And we've had a lot of fun over the last couple of years or so talking, just meeting up and talking about all of the things that we've found in the Mass Observation Archive that relate to royalty. Uh, so that's kind of what you're going to be listening to today. Um, we do have a, a chat function and I can, uh, my wonderful colleague Lindsay is here and has, has promised to keep an eye on it. Um, so if you do have any questions that arise as we're going through, please do add them in there or any comments as well, or indeed your own thoughts or memories on some of the things that we're going to be covering, some of the events we're going to be covering. Uh, but we will also have an opportunity for questions um, towards the end of the, um, the presentation. So we're probably going to speak for about um, half an hour or so about what we have found, what we're doing, um, and then we'll be opening it up. So um, over to you, Jen. Wonderful. So um, as Fiona said, this is um, part of the work that we're doing is uh, part of a book project for Bloomsbury Academics uh, Mass Observation Critical uh, Series. And we're delighted to have on the call um, our editor, uh, history editor, uh, Roger Mogford, who uh, can be available during question and answer uh, for questions that are specific to publishing with Bloomsbury or publishing in the series. So um, welcome, uh, Roger, to the call and also welcome to everybody. It's wonderful, as Fiona said, to see everybody out there. And, um, and it's exciting to get to share um, these conversations that Fiona and I have been having, as she said, for several years now about um, our explorations through the uh, through the archive um, in regards to royalty. Uh, so you can see on the screen there, you can see the series, you can see who's involved in it. Um, but Fiona, if you, Fiona's running the, the PowerPoint, so um, I'll give her some cues now and again. Uh, but if you wanna go on, um, you know, just thinking about mass observation in royalty, um, the whole reason why mass observation really sort of came into being in 1937 uh, was spurred on by, as many of you know, the abdication crisis of 1936. And so uh, we do have the impetus for mass observation really being a sort of royal impetus. And so from the very early days, we can see material that's being collected by mass observation that surrounds um, thinking uh, about the royal family and attitudes towards the royal family. And also that sort of day-to-day -day experience of uh, ordinary sort of um, observers and, and um, you know, the British public engaging with the royalty. Uh, and so you can see on the screen the various different kinds of ways in which we can see those engagements with uh, the British public um, at various different times across the across the 20th century and into the 21st century. So we have the two coronations of 37 and 53. We have jubilees. Uh, we have weddings and scandals and deaths and births and all sorts of material that we've been drawing from. Um, and really, I think what's also exciting about this project for me is the fact that um, 
we're really spanning both uh, the, the mid-century project and the, the current project. Um, and most of the material that I've been working with has been, um, has been in the mid-century. And Fiona has been working on um, the current um, MOP material. And so a lot of our conversations are really about the, the sort of continuities and changes that we're seeing. And it's really striking to see a lot of the continuities. And I think as we talk today, we'll, we, we hope to share some of that material uh, with you. And some of the, the guiding questions as we talk today, but also that you'll see in the book uh, when, it, uh, when it appears, hopefully, uh, hopefully next year, um, we're really thinking about are there changing attitudes to, to the British royal family over this 80 year period? Um, and we're really fascinated by how people engage with the royal family and royal events and how do they imagine themselves within the national fabric, but also how do they imagine themselves in, in more kinds of intimate relationships that we'll see with the royal family. So Fiona and I will, will uh, cover some of that material uh, today. Uh, if you want to go ahead and move the slide on. Um, so I'll be talking for the first part of this um, because we're going to be looking at this from a chronological perspective. And so just thinking about the early material, of course, as I said before, you have the abdication crisis, which spurs on the May the 12th uh, day surveys, uh, which eventually uh, become published as May the 12th, and it's one of the, uh, the first significant publications that mass observation puts out there. Uh, so I've gone through the di directives or uh, the day surveys for 1937, and then there's a directive for 1953 in the coronation, and there's, a, there's really a, a wealth of information uh, for the 1953 material. We have um, pre-coronation surveys, we have directives. Um, there's also these lovely essays that are written by school children uh, from the ages of nine to 16, uh, which are really informative because you get a good sense of what's going on in the classroom. How are teachers talking about royal events and how do children sort of imagine themselves participating in these things? So it's really exciting, the material uh, that we get to engage with um, in, in the mid-century. Um, uh, data set. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the coronations. Obviously, this is a jubilee year, and um, this is a jubilee month as well. And so it makes sense for us to sort of start off with coronations. And you'll see with this, um, with this passage here, and, and we're not going to read this for you, you can, um, I'll just sort of highlight out um, some of the information in each of these quotes. Uh, but we'll leave it to you to, to read through um, as we're talking about these uh, uh, these quotes and some of the material that we're finding. So what you'll sorry, see- Sorry, Jen, Jen, can I also just say, sorry, that we're recording this. So if there are quotes that you'd like to read in more depth, they'll be available on the recording, which will be on our YouTube channel shortly, so. That's a great, great, <laughs> great observation, Fiona. Thank you for that. Uh, so yeah, you'll be able to, to go back and, and, and look at these in more depth. Uh, but in this particular, in this particular quote that I've drawn out of the 1953 coronation directory or uh, directive, you'll see um, that this person reflects on the difference between 1937 and 1953. And what I really like about this is you get this sense of context, you get this sense of change over time. And I wanted to start here because it reminds us that in 1937, we, uh, the, the coronation was overshadowed uh, by the abdication crisis. What you see in that material is a lot of people reflecting on who is the rightful sovereign, who should be, um, who should be getting crowned. Um, in 1937. Uh, you see a lot of individuals talking about the fact that had it been Edward VIII, I would have engaged, I would have gone to London, I would have paid more attention, but since it's not, I'm not really that interested. Um, and then you see others who are engaged and in, are in fact um, sympathetic with the plight of George the Sixth for having to step in uh, into the breach when his when his brother abdicated responsibility um, and abdicated the duty. And so you do see this sort of polarization of attitudes in 1937. Um, at the other on the other side of this, in this quote, this is 1953, and this woman is thinking about 
what's going on in 1953 and you get this sense of a lot more excitement. You have a young woman who's uh, coming to the throne. Uh, it's an entirely different time period in the 1950s. There's a sort of um, new age, the new Elizabethan age uh, that people do engage with in the coronation material. And as they reflect on 1937, they also reflect on the fact of um, the, the difference in context. In 1937, we not only have the, the, the uh, abdication crisis, but we are also dealing with um, this world that seems like it's careening out of control. We've got the Crystal Palace uh, burning in, in um, uh, November of 1936. You have Cable Street riots uh, around the same time. You have the Jarrow March uh, that happens in October of 1936. Um, on the continent, um, we've got the rise of fascism. Uh, we've got saber rattling and Mussolini in Abyssinia or Ethiopia. Um, so it really feels like the world is out of control. It really feels like there's some darkness around 1937. And even that darkness sort of comes into the coronation because people wonder if this is, if if the rightful heir is being crowned and what's going on here. So the world sort of feels out of control for a lot of individuals. But in 1953, there does seem to be this hopefulness and you do see that in a lot of the material. Um, this woman also goes on to talk about how colorful the coronation of 1953 seems to be. Um, there's much more, there's more souvenirs, there's more bunting out, there's more flags out. Um, and so she's really thinking that there's more excitement about, uh, about 1953 than she remembers for 1937. Uh, Fiona, if you want to go on to the next one. Um, I think though one of the other things that fascinate me about the difference between the 1937 and 1953 coronations um, is the way in which people participated with these coronations. 1937 was the very first time that uh, the mass of the British public could really engage with the ceremony itself, could participate in the coronation. If you think back as many of my, uh, many of the uh, observers did, if you think back to George V's coronation, those celebrations are very local. Um, they're very much, um, I think, in, in time with previous coronations that had been going on for centuries, that you have fates and you have local processions, uh, you have the lighting of the beacons, um, and it's a very, very local experience. Um, it engages local identity. But in 1937, the coronation, the procession is televised and, um, and it shows up on, on radio, but the service itself, the coronation is also on radio. And so now you have this question, well, what, how do people act when they're listening on radio to a coronation? Do you, do you stop and uh, stop what you're doing? Um, do you pay close attention to the whole coronation service? Um, or can you do you know, domestic chores during the service? Uh, do you stand up when God Save the King is played and you're at home? Um, what do you do? Should you be quiet during the anointing? What, what kinds of things, um, how should we behave? Uh, and I think that's really fascinating because now you've got individuals who can imagine themselves in Westminster Abbey acting as participants in this coronation ceremony, which we don't get uh, at any previous time. And that's really fascinating to me. And you can see uh, with this particular quote that I've drawn out of uh, the day survey material, this individual talks about the importance of radio and he talks about how he sort of um, is transported into the procession and also transported into the Abbey. And this um, this gentleman actually goes on for pages upon pages talking about how he imagines what everybody's wearing in the Abbey, how he imagines what the scepter and orb looks like and the wonderful craftsmanship of that, what all the jewelry uh, looks like that people are wearing. He really has a very, very deep and descriptive experience of being in that Abbey. And then he also sort of goes off and imagines 
what Christ is thinking about this whole coronation um, uh, ceremony. And he's commenting on that as well. And I think what that does for me anyway, is it shows you how people might engage with that radio experience, how they engage with what's called the theater of the mind. Because when you're listening to the radio, the wireless, you don't have those visuals, except for maybe the Radio Times or the Listener or any of your newspapers that have pictures of what might be going on. You get to construct the scene when you're listening in on radio. And certainly I see that in a number of the responses to the day surveys, which is really fascinating. You see um, you see all the color and the glitz and, and the excitement and the celebration through that experience of the radio. Um, Fiona, would you like to move on to the next one? Uh, of course, in 1953, the big, um, the big excitement was that uh, you could watch the coronation and the procession on television. And a lot of the uh, observers will talk about that. And it's really, it's really fun to actually watch it in, in, um, in play during the essays that are written by the children about how excited they are to be able to, to watch it on television and where they're going, how they're going to their aunts, um, you know, several miles away, and it's a big day, and it's very exciting for them. So television, obviously, as many of you know, looms large over the 1953 um, coronation, but a lot of people reflect on the difference between that experience and the radio experience, and some individuals like this one that we see here as they compare the radio and the television experience, they believe that the radio experience is actually um, superior to the television experience. Um, they believe that the television, as you see here, the television um, detracts from the occasion, um, that it somehow diminishes the occasion because it's reduced to a very, very small screen. Of course, it's in black and white, so you don't see that, that sort of colorful um, um, you know, the colorful pageantry that's going on in that coronation. And some people did not like that. And in fact, I see uh, individuals turn off the television and listen to the radio, or very specifically listen to the radio instead of the television at all. And I find that really fascinating. On the other side of things, if you go onto the next screen, other people reflect on how television brings them into the experience. And so much like I talked about with the radio, this individual says uh, that you know, people are on the inside, even though the, only the nobility are there in the Abbey, we are actually there, we can experience it. And television is really important for us. Um, and I also find this quote very fascinating because it reminds us of the context yet again. The last coronation was anticlimax um, because of the Windsor affair. And you get this sense of the post-war um, context of, you know, in 1951, you have the, um, um, the Festival of Britain and you have, like I said before, this idea of the new Elizabethan age. And so you do see that people are really wanting a celebration, that they are looking forward to a young monarch in a, in a beautiful, uh, a beautiful family. You, you see people commenting on, um, on the, the royal family as being um, beautiful and Philip being dashing and they're very youthful. So there's a lot of promise and excitement with this. And you can see some people like this individual thinks that that reflects on uh, the greatness of, of Britain, that this is going to be broadcast around the world, and people are going to see how wonderful we are and the fact that we do these things so well. Uh, so you'll see that uh, uh, through the material, um, too. And I think we can, we can move on. I hope I'm not... Uh, I'm probably taking too long, Fiona, so I'll, I'll, I'll cover these pretty quickly. Um, the other things that we'll see in, in the material, in the mid-century uh, mid material, but also that Fiona sees in um, the latter material, uh, is just what people are doing to prepare. Um, so reporting on um, the preparations in their town how um, how you see cabs with flags on them and various different souvenirs that are showing up in the colors of the Union Jacks and the various different street parties that are being planned. Um, and then all of the kinds of um, drama that goes around uh, goes along with the street parties. There's a lot of there's a lot of conversation um, about that as well. Um, and I also uh, enjoyed this bit since um, I'm 
I'm coming to you from America, uh, this sort of notion of the American invasion that Americans love royal events. And um, we'll see that in a lot of the material I see is Americans show up in London to be part of these things. And, and it's, um, it's a fascinating kind of um, uh, experience and, and engagement that people are having as mass observers to talk about, well, here come the Americans again. But it also underscores how important these events are in an international, uh, in an international way, in an international frame. So I think that's also uh, fascinating to see. Uh, on the next slide, uh, there's some material about the street parties, um, you know, and how children are very much a part of this. Um, and you know the old age pensioners are also invited, and these are the these are the um, the parties that that the local uh, you know um, local stores and shops are putting on, and local um, councils are putting on. And you also see comments, a lot of comments about the various different um, mugs and souvenirs that are that are being created for the local children and what the children are getting for that and how excited they are to receive those the essays also talk about those um, as well and i i was really fascinated by this image that you see here uh, that one of the observers drew which um describes he describes it in his uh, in his writing but he, he also took a uh he he drew a, a picture for us and this is a windmill that's been constructed over a cinema marquee um, and it's red, white and blue and it's got lights that sort of uh, go on and off and the windmill sort of turns and it says, God bless the queen. So you do through this material, you can sort of experience these local celebrations. I'll go on to the next slide. Um, for the mid-century material, I also um, I was also looking at the royal wedding of 1947, um, and in in the material that we see here, you get a lot of um, you get a lot of observers sort of reflecting on the media um, and how the media is telling this story of the wedding, how the it's a fairy tale uh, fairy tale wedding how it's sort of this uh, love match. And a lot of people do talk about that love match. Um, some people are cynical about it and some people really buy into it. Um, and so you'll see people talk about um, whether or not this is a love match. They'll talk about sympathy for how the royal family has to be in the limelight so much. And then on the other side of the screen, I've added uh, a quote here that just sort of talks about how people engage with these types of events in a very personal way. And this person here says, every parent who's ever married a daughter um, knows how the king and queen felt. All married women understand how Elizabeth is feeling at this very moment. And we see this happening over and over and over again in the material. And it's really fascinating how ordinary individuals sort of try to engage with the royal family and they engage in their own sort of personal space in their own um, personal ways. Uh, I wanna be careful of the timing, um, Fiona. I think the last thing that I'll just say about 1947, and we can, we can come back to this because I wanna make sure that Fiona has some time uh, to talk about this. Um, but in 1947, in those materials that I looked at, um, 47 seems to be the most critical of all of the material that I've looked at. This is, I think, because of the austerity of the, of the moment. You see a lot of people thinking about um, whether it's appropriate to have such a big celebration at this time, the cost of the wedding. Um, you see some people talk about the fact that they've had to forego their weddings at this moment. And some people are quite angry about that. And some people actually wanna live vicariously through it. And they say, well, this is wonderful because I can't get married yet. And so I'm just sort of going to experience it now. And then later I'll be able to have my time. Uh, but I think a lot of the criticism that I see reflected in 1947 comes through because of austerity, uh, because of 
um, how other people are having such a, a rough go at it. And it just seems inappropriate. It's at this point where I see most people or many people talking about being Republican in attitude. And I don't see that as much in any of the other material. So we can talk about that uh, at the end of uh, our presentation. And then finally, I just have a, a quick note on wartime. There are no specific directives um, that mass observation put out during the war. So it makes it really tricky to gauge what individuals are saying about the royalty during the war. When I do look through the diaries, which is how we can look at that, we kind of can get through it, uh, through the material sort of in, uh, in oblique angles. You can find some of the royalty. Um, but I find something that's really fascinating about, um, about the um, wartime material is the silence. Um, and we can talk more about that um, at, the end of, uh, at the end of the presentation. So um, Fiona, <laughs> I don't know how much time I've left you and I apologize for, for there's so much information, but uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Oh, please don't worry. Please don't worry, because I think a lot of what I've got to say is actually very it, it echoes what you're saying or what you have said in terms of attitudes. Um, but just briefly, so a mass observation when it restarted um, in well, actually in 1977, um, there was um, a survey done on the Silver Jubilee, um, which I haven't included in here, um, but we are hoping to be able to look at the material for that and to include it in the book. But what I've been concentrating on is very much the materials from 1981 up to 2022. And I've just listed here a few of the, the directives that have reference to um, royalty within them and the years that they come. Um, for those of you who are classicists, you will appreciate my Anai Horribiles as opposed to the Annus Horribilis. Um, because it always struck me as I uh, as, as rather funny that the Queen only seems to have ever had one bad year, um, when actually looking through a lot of the work that uh, mass observers have done over the year, there have been quite a few bad years in there. So, um, But what I'm going to do is just concentrate on a handful of these over the next um, 10 minutes or so. Uh, there is a lot of words and there are a lot of quotes in here um, and I will say again, please do, if you want to read these in more detail, please do have a look at the recording when it um, comes through on the YouTube channel. Um, but I'm going to go through chronologically and I'm going to start with 1981, which, of course, um, many of you may remember was the, the royal wedding uh, when there only seemed to be one royal wedding at the time. And that was the, the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. And I think what struck me as I was reading through a lot of the responses to this and to the other weddings that I will cover shortly, um, including that um, Sarah Ferguson to Prince Andrew, William to Kate, I haven't quite got to Harry and, and Meghan yet, but um, is that the, the responses often reflect the times in which people are writing. So Jen um, mentioned there about 1947 being um, a time that there was a lot of criticism towards the royal family, and that echoes the, the hardships that the country was feeling. And that really comes through, I think, particularly in 1981 as well. We have a, a country that is in um, vast economic distress. Um, we have um, uh, I've written all of these, but I can't remember, yeah, riots going on, you know, employment is really, really high. And suddenly in the middle of that is launched this massive royal wedding, um, which is watched across the globe. I think I was looking up the, the numbers and they were thinking of something like three billion people had watched it. Um, and again, we see in mass observation this real contrast of how people respond to it. People thinking it's an absolute or, you know, too much money in such hard times, how awful this is. Um, and then others saying, actually, I really enjoyed it. It was really nice to feel happy. It was nice to feel slightly different uh, to the way that we're feeling. It's a change instead of having to watch all of the riots that go on. Um, and I think that there was a, a, a other kind of cultural changes that come through as well. Jen was talking earlier about what people were doing. Um, a lot more people in 1981 were also sitting down to watch it, to watch it together, to watch it in groups, to go around to people's houses, in part because black and white TV was still really um, common in people's homes and people wanted to see it in colour. So they were popping down the road to watch somebody's big colour set. 
Um, so again, there's that really kind of interesting cultural as well as a social um, echoing what's going on in the way people are responding to the royal wedding. Um, I'm going to skip now on to 1992, um, which was the Annus Horribilis. Uh, that the Queen announced at her speech at the Guildhall. I think it was actually her, get, get my maths right here, it was the 40th anniversary of her accession. And she gave this speech saying, you know, this is a really, this has been a really hard year for my family. Um, and what happens in mass observation is a real echoing of that negativity, um, that sort of sense of, as you can see here at the top, the royal family is in a shocking state. We have the breakdown of Prince and Princess of Wales marriage, uh, Sarah, Sarah and Andrew's marriage. Also, I think the uh, Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips also separate that year. There's also the um, fire at Windsor Castle. Some of you may remember that some of the, you know, the Queen's favourite castle things were burning down in it. Um, and that also gave rise to discussion about who should pay for the, the damage, who should pay for the repairs of it. So suddenly um, there's this sense of the royal family becoming like any other family, having woes. And we have a quote here about classlessness seems more noticeable now that their marital troubles are on a par with those of the common people. And, and people who have professed to being royalists actually starting to think, you know, how relevant is this family now? And interestingly, though, there is still a loyalty to the Queen. And I find that echoed throughout all of this. Whatever happens, apart from a little bit of concern around 1997, which I'll come to next, um, people are very loyal to the Queen, even if they don't particularly believe in the monarchy. They think she's a good thing. Occasionally, things don't go well, um, and often it's the people around her who are criticised by the mass observers. It's the people advising her who they see as the, the, the baddies in this, rather than the Queen herself. But a crunch point for that was 1997, and the death of Princess Diana um, in August in Paris 1997 was, was an interesting one because... Um, Mass observation hadn't actually put a call out immediately, but people started to write into it. So Dorothy Sheridan put out a, a request as a special directive saying, please record, you know, send stuff in. This is coming in anyway, so send it in. And there's a huge outpouring of uh, grief, of anger, of shock, um, but also I think of identification. And again, this is something that Jen has mentioned and that we've talked about a lot is people putting themselves in the position of losing a loved one and how the royal family must be feeling about it. So lots of judgments being made on the coldness that people are perceiving from the Queen and her family because they themselves couldn't feel that cold in, in, in a similar uh, situation. But equally, people feeling um, this is crazy. The media have blown it out of all proportion. And that's something that gets reflected in the weddings as well. Other events that go on, people being tired of sort of having uh, upcoming nuptials thrust down their throat, but really comes in for criticism around the, the death of Princess Diana around 1997. Uh, people feeling that the this mass hysteria that seemed to take place is triggered very much by um, the media making people feel they need to be part of this club. Um, and I think some people have actually described it as that membership of a, of a club of, of mourning. Um, but others did feel very strongly about it. So we have here about somebody writing about her charisma, um, um, but also at the bottom of this particular page, someone crying, I cried and cried as if my best friend had died. And there are still days when I feel this. This was actually written, this piece was written a few weeks later. And the person was still feeling that sense of grief um, for losing somebody that she'd never met. Somebody who was, was little more than a sort of, you know, a, a celebrity figure, I suppose, in, in, in life. So moving on swiftly, only five years later, the Queen celebrates her golden jubilee. Um, after the silver jubilee, this is the first big jubilee that gets celebrated. Um, and I think it's still at this point we can see that the royal family aren't in a particularly good place. 
a lot of people talk about how um, the, the celebrations are irrelevant, how they're not a patch on what happened in 1977, that the time for that sort of thing is, is past. And in fact, as I was going through my quotes uh, to pull some out here, I found very, very few positive quotes, but people not engaging in, in the Jubilee celebrations much at all, except I found this one, which was our small hamlet, um, been planning for quite a full celebration for the Queen. Good to have something to bring us together after foot and mouth isolating us for so long. And it reminded me of the foot and mouth crisis that we experienced in 2001, 2002 in the UK and how so many communities were, were you know, down on their knees because of this. And it just that's what struck me about mass observation um that I had forgotten this and suddenly the reality of that awful time for so many was brought forth just in the one line that was there but that's that's beside that's that's not that's not about the royal family but that's about the joy of mass observation so flicking on very quickly um my most recent work has been done on um the wedding of William and uh Kate Middleton in 2011 and I thought this was quite an interesting one because we'd had um, the a, a bit of a gap between 2002, which was the Royal Jubilee, uh, the Golden Jubilee, but also the death of the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. And again, a lot of sympathy for the Queen having to do this Jubilee, having lost two big people in her life. Um, but then it goes quite quiet. There's a little bit about Charles and Camilla getting married, but there's not a huge amount um, in mass observation about the royal family. And indeed, it seems to be quite a quiet time for the royal family anyway, in terms of, of, of public engagement in that way. But then 2011 hits and it becomes, um, I think, a really interesting turning point because suddenly it's about the new generation of royals. And it's the first time that we understand how mass observers feel about this new generation. And a lot of the discussion in, in there is about the uh, informality, the modern feeling of this couple and what they're bringing to the royal family. We have here a quote on the right hand side about this attempt to strike an informal, modern, maybe even cost cutting note. So that sort of sense of, being able to make a nod to what people are experiencing outside. But if you go through that quote, it also makes me smile because it's somebody saying, well, this is a bit daft, actually, because, you know, these attempts at informality felt flat. The minor royals trooping on and off their minibuses on the way to the Abbey as though it was a work outing, uh, canapes and finger food. Um, it'd be really interesting to understand a little bit more about why that's not why it has fallen flat for this person is it because actually they're looking for something they're looking for the royal family to be different rather than start to be the same a lot of criticism still though um, around the money that's spent on it and so forth uh, this particular quote I quite liked because the main moan of them was the fact that it was it was a you know change the bank holidays and the economic impact that that had uh, equally that's balanced out by many people saying it was great I had a long weekend so I went away and, and myself and my partner walked in the Lake District for four whole days and ignored the royal wedding it gave people that opportunity to escape it as well as to enjoy it and many people did enjoy it too I should say but anyway I'm aware of time um, and so what we wanted to sort of uh, finish up by was thinking a bit through some of those recurring themes that we both found at either end of the mass observation time scale um, but that echo all of the way through. Um, so Jen, do you yeah, want I mean, to talk about identity and engagement? Yeah, I mean I think uh, I think what's so fascinating to me is is to see um, the some of the mass observers who, like you, like you brought up, are, are crying at the death of of Diana, um, who are sort of feel let down by the fact that the wedding of William and Kate is over, and sort of oh, it was just a wonderful experience, and um, and now it's over. And I'm fascinated by that sort of personal relationship that people that people try to construct, it's sort of a parasocial, they don't know you exist, but you are trying to engage with them. And this mm -hmm. is the thing about celebrity and also the royals, because the royals don't fit nicely with the concept of celebrity. And in fact, a lot of mass observers comment on that, that being a celebrity sort of undermines 
um, the, uh, the power of the royalty. And a lot of observers sort of seem to be uncomfortable with that. Uh, but still, you can't ignore them. You know, which is what you were saying, like, at least with the bank holidays, you can go for a walk in the Lake District and ignore them altogether. Um, but it's hard not to see the royalty. And so you have to, on some level, engage with it. And that's what we're seeing through the mass observation material. Uh, but it is, it, it's fascinating to see that. And then also the national identity component of it, because in many ways, the royalty are like the flag. Um, there's, they are a symbol of Britishness, a symbol for people of either greatness or just tradition. Um, they can bring money in to Britain. There's tourism value, um, and yet there's cost to them. Um, and so I, I, I think that's also really kind of fascinating, this sort of the sense of Britishness that um, threads its way through the material. And I'll say one final thing about re republicanism um, and that national identity piece. When I look at some of the material and I think about, um, I think about the, the future of the royalty, which is always sort of one of those big questions when you look at the royalty and the monarchy, uh, will it last? Um, when, you, when you look at this material, you see a lot of people who are either super, super supportive or who believe that it works for Britain. It's very British because what would you be if you didn't have your monarch? You would be American or French and that's not going to work for us. Um, and so you see this sort of, um, even if people are on the fence about, about the royalty, you see this sense of stability and tradition and that why, why mess with it? Um, mm. Because we don't, you know, we don't, we think it gives us something unique to anybody else out there. And I think that's something that's echoed throughout the, the sort of 40 years of the, the project as well, the Mass Observation Project, um, particularly more recently, actually, where people have questioned the relevance, but then said, but it's better than whatever the alternative might be. They, they don't always state what that alternative might be. Mm -hmm. Um but I think that there's a the, your your comment on national identity was really interesting as well because even those who are very critical often will say, but this does show how good the British are at pomp and ceremony or how good we are at organising things, and there's a pride in the fact the rest of the world is watching. Mm -hmm. So even though we can moan about it ourselves, we can be very proud about it um, elsewhere. So the, there's a really interesting kind of contrast that often an individual writer will have you know they feel quite conflicted themselves in in how this will be mm -hmm. and I think maybe just to finish off so that we can open up for other questions and thoughts on this um we are um about to launch the next directive which will have a third part in it which is about royalty in in 2022 and of course that it's been quite a significant year for many years for many reasons we've had the um the the platinum jubilee uh, but also the death of the prince of uh sorry uh, the duke of edinburgh um the scandal around um prince andrew um and also you know the sort of the, the change in the balance of the royal family the um william and and kate suddenly becoming much more active much more to the fore whilst Harry and, and Meghan have sort of fallen to the back. So it'd be really interesting to see how people feel, how, how think events might have changed the way they think, but also about where they feel this will go in the future and whether Charles has got more sympathy about becoming Charles III, which is something that constantly I've been reading people going, oh, we don't want Charles III, we'll go straight to William, please. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just comment on that really quickly, and maybe we can we can talk about it if people are interested in it. Just this this notion that Camilla has been tapped to be queen moving forward, whereas if you looked in the 1990s, there was this sort of in early 2000s, there was a sort of pushback on Camilla ever getting close uh, to uh, you know to the king or to becoming queen. And I think this is really fascinating because look at 1990s, and you can look at the the polling. Uh, and the polling really maps nicely to what Fiona is, is talking about in the 1990s, a sort of nadir of uh, public sentiment. Um, and I think we're pulling out of that. We've been pulling out of that for 20 years now. And, it, and I think William and Kate are 
are part of that, um, are very much part of it. And I see Charles as this sort of stopgap, very much like George the Sixth, that he, you know, he's sort of this momentary, um, momentary monarch that we'll begin to see. We're all waiting for William. Is basically it. Um, so it's 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 kind of curious. I'll be interested to see what people, what questions people have for us, and and what thoughts um, you all are thinking. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so um, I think I've stopped sharing. Have I stopped sharing? Yep. 